say, Odell, did you get your sheets from Mike Lindell? Yeah, I got my I got my sheets, man. I love them. I had a great night's sleep, and I tell you what, these Giza Dream bed sheets is just you know you think the pillow's great, but Mike did an even better job with the Giza Dream bed sheets, Bill. And our listeners can get the Giza Dream bed sheets from a special offer Mike is making for twenty nine ninety eight, just twenty nine ninety eight. Yep, and you can go to his website. You know he he, he has mypillow.com. Uh, and use the promo code COMMON. But, you know, it's interesting. He didn't stop just at making pillows. He decided to make bed sheets, and he made the best pillow, and now he's making the best bed sheets. So, Bill, twenty nine ninety eight, and all our listener audience have to do is call 1-800-238-7281 and use the promo code COMMON, C-O-M-M-O-N. That's it? That's it. Wow. Thanks for the support. Coming up in this episode of Finding Common Ground. We must have criminal justice reform that emphatically says Black Lives Matter. And we also have to remember that defunding the police is an absolute tragedy uh, for marginalized communities. If you take the police out some of the rough communities I grew up in, trust me, you don't want to do that. We're talking about getting in front of it, going, being upriver from these things and working with individuals before it shows up in your system. There are two sides to every coin. How do we deal with racial issues when they affect relationships? Finding common ground on all those issues that we come against. There's black and there's white. And I think as Christians, we have to learn how to get together because we're not in heaven. I've met more interesting people just by God just bringing them in. Republicans and Democrats. But a lot of times when it comes to race and it comes to culture and it comes to perception, even as Christians, we don't always understand. We look at it through our lenses. There's Bill. I grew up in a suburb of Cleveland called Parma. Uh, Any black the, people in Parma? There was not one. Not one black person, not Bill? Not one. Come not on, Bill, you got to have one, a, a nope. token black person, a token. And black there's Odell. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, public housing, single mom, divorced single mom with four kids, and I came up through segregation and all that kind of stuff. If a black person drove through the town, the police would stop and escort them out. Bill and Odell are finding common ground. A part of what we have to do is listen to each other, find the common ground, and question, not questioning you like you're on a witness stand, but questioning you for a better understanding. Father God, we just come to you just to say thank you for your grace and mercy. Just thank you for always looking out for the least of these, God. God, in so many instances, you use us, those who you've blessed over the years, to be the eyes, the ears, the voice. And God, we don't mind. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes we walk by faith and not by sight. But God, you're always faithful. So I just say thank you for choosing me. Thank you for trusting me with your word. In Jesus' precious name, we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for my friendship and love I have for Odell and his family. Uh, thank you for our guest today, Ben David, uh, District Attorney from Wilmington. Lord, uh, thank you for opening doors. Um, you opened so many doors in my life to meet uh, and work with some great people. Uh, and uh, Ben David is one of those. And uh, Lord, let me have the courage to go through those doors. Because many times when those doors open, I look in and I go, I don't know if I want to walk through that. And uh, And I find out if I don't, you keep nudging me until I do. And once I do, then I'm I look back and I say, boy, what was I afraid of? What was I concerned about? But thank you, Lord, for opening doors. Amen. Well, gracious and merciful God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these friendships, for these men, Odell and Bill, that have such a great platform to reach so many people. Thank you for the Chief Justice, Paul Newby, and the mm -hmm. task force members who are working on making our courts more trauma-informed. It was in the book of Micah where we've all been directed uh, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. And so we ask that as we bring ourselves into conversation today that we are granted wisdom. And we ask for your loving hand upon this effort as we seek to better the great state of North Carolina. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
So, Bill, you know, I'm excited about get our guest today. I was listening to some of his uh, speeches, one in particular, the TED Talk, and he said that he speaks for the dead in murder trials. And, and you know, that just really, it really got to me because, you know, the Bible talks about Cain, Abel, uh, the blood cries out. The blood cries out from the ground. So, Bill, I usually like to chit chat with you, but today I'm a chit nor chat with you. I want to hear from Ben. I I, I, I want to hear from Ben because Ben is talking about saving lives. Ben is talking about building community. Ben is talking the talk I want to hear. Bill, what say you, my friend? I I totally agree. I want to hear about how he uh, is finding bridges that have holes in them, and he's plugging those holes. So, uh, uh. District Attorney Ben David, would you come in and uh, introduce yourself and let's get rolling. Gentlemen, thank you so much. I'm Ben David, District Attorney for New Hanover and Pender Counties. Um, we have two great counties that I represent. Uh, Burga is the county seat of Pender and Wilmington is the county seat of New Hanover. So we have a geographic size about the size of Rhode Island in my district. 300,000 people live here. On any given year, we'll have 5,000 felonies, 20,000 misdemeanors, and 50,000 traffic tickets in my district. Um, we have a person a week dying of heroin and fentanyl. Uh, we have over 50 pending murder cases and another 30 fatalities on our roads. So when Odell talks about speaking for the dead, we do that. Um, we also give victims a voice at the courthouse and we're supposed to be the conscience for the community anytime a crime occurs. I started my career as a prosecutor the day after the Columbine tragedy in April of 1999. And I was fortunate to become the elected district attorney in 2004. So I've just uh, been reelected for what is the start of my sixth term. And I'm very excited to represent um, not only the 300,000 people in our community, but the 1,200 officers and 20 different police agencies who put their lives on the line every day and lead a team of nearly 50 people in the district attorney's office who are the ones who truly get the people's work done. And I'm excited to talk to you about how we can not only respond to crime and prove it in a courtroom, but maybe to prevent it in the first place. And, and wouldn't that be a noble goal if we could actually stop some of the tragedies that we see day in and day out? Well, that that's absolutely right. And that leads us into the the discussion about adverse childhood experiences and making kids resilient that I know you're very, very involved in uh, down there in Wilmington and the surrounding area. Well, thank you for this opportunity to talk about ACEs. ACEs is an acronym. It stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences and also Adverse Community Environments. Um, it has been around for a while, but it's something pretty new to the court system. I particularly want to call out Chief Justice Paul Newby, a good friend of mine, um, as well as Andrew Heath, who is the Administrative Office of the Court's Director, who co-chairs a task force with me under the Chief Justice to make our courts more ACEs informed. Um, and what that really is all about is trauma. We are talking about nothing less than stopping the revolving door of recidivism uh, by lifting up our children understanding that high crime areas are also high victim areas, understanding that today's victim is tomorrow's defendant, and ACEs talks about both of those things. Um, it is a science of hope, and it is a biology of stress. It is about how we can use science not only to, again, solve these cases and prove them in a courtroom, but to prevent cases from ever occurring by understanding that if we can get resources to our children today, uh, we will prevent their victimization and them coming into the courts as defendants in the future if we put our loving arms around them now when they are being traumatized, because that's who ends up being overwhelmingly in the criminal justice system as both victims and defendants. And so that's where our resources need to go. Well, you mentioned the task force that you chair, co-chair, uh, and I think you have an event coming up in uh, Wake Forest uh, in a couple of weeks. Yes, I was pleased to um, go to Wake Forest 30 years ago as a law student and now to return there with Chief District Court Judge Jay Corpening, who's also a graduate, um, is a real um, honor for me. Uh, all the task force members, by the way, will be there. Um, we have a very diverse task force made up of justice stakeholders throughout the entire system. So we have 
everything from public defenders and prosecutors to um, chiefs of police and sheriffs, um, judges at the district and superior court level, and obviously at the Supreme Court level with our chief justice chairing it. Um, we have people who are in metro areas like Wilmington and rural areas like Burgos, uh, from the mountains to the sea. Um, and I also wanna stress that this is not political. Um, I happen to be, for instance, an elected Democrat. My identical twin brother, who's the neighboring district attorney in Brunswick, Bladen and Columbus County is, a, is an elected Republican. And one thing we've always said is child molesters don't ask kids what party they belong to before they victimize them. Drug hmm. dealers don't ask people on a street corner what party they belong to when they sell them these poison substances. Why should people be asking that about our court system? Hmm. And so we have all come together, a very diverse group, diverse in every respect, to try to set aside whatever differences we might have in the interest of our children. And what we have found is 100% um, of us agree about the absolutely urgency of, of having the courts become more trauma informed. Wow. You know, uh, I'm going to be attending that uh, along with our executive director, Jim Allegretto. We're, we're on the advisory board. So this will be our first time to attend it. And uh, I'm anxious to learn. Well, and, and if, Bill, if I may, what I'll say about that is we're talking about the 3rd of February, which is a Friday. Uh, from noon to one, we're going to have a public event um, at the law school at the World Professional Center. Um, and the meeting of the task force is going to be going on from 8.30 to 2.30 that day. And that is also open to the public. We're just going to be spending that hour in the middle during our lunchtime to have a much more public event with the law students and larger bar of Forsyth County. Uh, but anyone is welcome to attend. And along the way, we not only involve all these justice stakeholders, but we have a very talented advisory committee made up of professionals from the medical system and the um, philanthropic world, um, people who are in the trenches, in other words, understanding that the root causes of crime are the same as the social determinants of health. And that's why we are combining these two great efforts together um, to try and work on crime prevention and, and working on how we can get treatment for the people who need it in the criminal justice system. Oh, that's outstanding. Odell? Yeah, Ben, question, who's the spearhead person in Guilford County or Greensboro in particular? Well, I, I have to give a shout out, first of all, to the Kellen Foundation and specifically Dr. Kelly Graves of PhD with that uh, foundation. She has um, put together an incredible uh, manual called Resilient NC, supporting statewide efforts to build community resilience. Um, she, along with several other professionals in the medical industry, um, have done a, a deep dive on the efforts around our great state in the 100 counties uh, to really do something in the best interest of our children. Um, that report came out November 1st of 2021, so it's now been out for about a year. Um, and uh, Dr. Graves, like many people in the justice system um, in Guilford County, are a part of this great effort. Um, Avery Crump, who is a good friend of mine and the elected district attorney there, um, is certainly someone who I would highly commend to you also if you want to learn more about ACES. Gotcha. Thank you. And I know her personally. Question for you. As a DA, and you've been it for the last X amount of years, a couple of things. And, and hear me out first. And I'll ask the audience to hear me out too. As a Black Democrat, as a Black man who grew up in public housing, very poor, divorced, single mom of four, uh, probably have a zillion of those aces you talk about, and I don't make light of it. But the whole resilience part, I understand that. Now, one of the things that I get in a lot of trouble for, but trouble's not always bad, you know, sometimes it's good trouble. When I make a statement that in some cases, the majority of the homicides in Greensboro, North Carolina happen to be African-American males, then you look at the other side of the, the trigger finger who committed the homicide, it's a double whammy because it's usually African-American males. Now, I'm not stereotyping anything like that. That's the facts. And when I say that, people get very, very bothered with me. And I say that if a white police officer shoots a black male, we will burn down the city and all this kind of stuff. However, 
if a black man kills another black man, in some cases, nothing is said. So as a DA, you had to deal with the George Floyd, everything there, and I'm 100% behind Black Lives Matter, uh, peaceful protests. I'm 100% against uh, violence and looting and all this. How did you handle the Black, I mean, the George Floyd situation? Because we know that that was a murder done. But now you had to deal with the spillover in your city with all the passion of the young people, and rightfully so. But how did you deal with that? from a DA's perspective, sir? Thank you for the question. First of all, let me say that as district attorney, um, no one fights more for the poor and the oppressed than a prosecutor. And here's why, the vast majority of the people who are under the blanket at crime scenes look a lot like you, Odell. And by that, I mean um, people of color, 81% um, of the murder victims in the time I've been district attorney in Wilmington have been people of color and the vast majority below the poverty line. That's in stark contrast to the overall county numbers that's about 16% uh, for that same number. And the, the mirror image rule of crime says that people are victimized by those who are demographically identical twins with them. So it's not mm -hmm. surprising to hear that 81% of the defendants in those cases are from that exact same demographic, get demographic category. Now, having said that, here's how I deal with it. Um, I remind people that the most famous person from Wilmington is a guy named Michael Jordan. You've probably heard of him. Right when the Black Lives Matter movement was born in Ferguson, North Carolina, about seven years ago, after Michael Brown was shot by a police officer, um, Michael Jordan did something remarkable that very few people remember. Okay. He said, as a black man in America, we need to do a whole lot better than we've been doing in the criminal justice system. And so I'm going to give a million dollars today to the NAACP wow. because we need to fight for sincere criminal justice reform. And I stood up and cheered for him when he did that because he was right. And it really came to a head when that murder on film happened in Minneapolis with George Floyd. But here's the second thing Michael Jordan did that I like to remind people of. He said, as the son of a man who was murdered, I yes. know that there's no amount of money that can keep me safe or keep my family safe. And I require the best people involved in our community when those cases happen. In other words, we need to have the best police. We need to have the best prosecutors. So I'm also giving a million dollars today to the Policeman's Benevolent Association. Wow. So what he did right there, Odell, is what I think too many people have forgotten. They get into camps. They either say, you are either for the blue and for law enforcement or you're for criminal justice reform. What Michael Jordan said back then, and I repeat today, it's not either or, it's yes and. We must have criminal justice reform that emphatically says Black Lives Matter and that protects all people equally and holds everyone accountable and no one's above the law or beneath its protection. And we also have to remember that defunding the police is an absolute tragedy uh, for marginalized communities because they're the I agree with you 100 percent I agree with you 100 percent defund the police is I don't want to say the most ridiculous thing because I don't want to try to demean someone else's perspective however if you take the police out some of the rough communities I grew up in oh my god then you trust me you don't want to do that but let me ask another question though Michael Jordan doesn't get that credit though why don't more people know about what you said? Because we know about let's just do it, Nike and the swoosh and the, the Michael. But what you're saying, that's golden. Does he speak out like that quite often or is it just you and him are buddies and y'all just hang out together? I, I wish I was buddies with Michael Jordan. No, I, <laughs> I, I saw what he said and I try to remind people of his greatness um, in that moment and how important it is for us to continue with that dialogue because it's absolutely the case that, you know, when, when people say, well, I'm against defunding, I, I don't say we need to refund the police. They should have never got a demotion to begin with. What I say is we need to fully fund public safety. And what that means is, yes, we want people who are, are good with de-escalating a situation and knowing about mental health to work alongside police. Yes, we need drug treatment and mental health treatment in the criminal justice system and out on the street. But that doesn't mean you need to forget about all the good police work and, and the necessary 
enforcement of the laws uh, that are in the criminal justice system already. You truly can do both of those things. Um, it takes all of us to say that, Odell. I, I say it without apology, knowing full well that even as I talk, there's going to be people online that are you know, going to say negative things about me. Verdict means to speak the truth. And right. that's what we ask juries to do with a verdict at the end of a trial. And I believe we have the same duty to speak the truth uh, when we're talking about nothing less than the safety of our communities. Well, when you talk about you speak for the dead and murder trials, can you kind of drill down in that so our audience really understand your heart and your passion, please? I'll tell you what, I, I, I really became committed to this job and want to do it the rest of my life. Um, when I was speaking um, in a closing argument on behalf of an eight-year-old child who happened to be a child of color and below the poverty line, he was killed by a stray bullet in a war not of his own making. Um, his wow. name was Little Papa. The, 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 actually, if you go to um, the, the housing complex where he was killed, the park is now named Demetrius Green Park for him. Um, and wow. we just passed the 25th year anniversary of that case. He should be 33 years old today, but he'll always be eight. And it was somewhere in meeting his family and in never getting to meet him where I recognized that this is the most important thing you can do as a lawyer. I mean, you know, I had paid off all my loans from Wake Forest in three years working for an amazing law firm called Kilpatrick Stockton, the largest law firm in, in North Carolina at the time. And they pay their starting associates three times what a prosecutor makes. And he said, you know, brother, you can make money or you can make a difference. Why don't, why don't you do this for the rest of your life and I'll do it myself and we'll be DAs together. And I'll tell you, I've never looked back because when you get the opportunity to get justice for a child like that and, and their family, right. um, what you realize is, you know, there's nothing that can replace that. Uh, especially money can. Um, and, and the thought that you're doing something that can make the community safer by removing people from society who are really dangerous, that's an important facet of it. But, but specifically with respect to what we're talking about today, you know, why do we accept the fact that hundreds of North Carolinians will die this year in the opioid epidemic, that it's the leading cause of death in America for people under 50, that it is a plane wow. crash 270 Americans every day are losing their lives to this epidemic. Why do we not speak for them right now and say, why are we waiting for them to die to care about what's going on? We know who's going to be abusing the drugs. It's the people who are self-medicating the trauma they experienced as children. So if we can turn back the clock and reach that intercept point, going upstream and stopping the hole in the bridge from people falling through, then maybe what we can do is prevent people from ever dying in that terrible pandemic that we call the opioid wars. And so I think we can do more than just look back after a, a knife and gun case and speak for the dead. We can actually know the flow of crime and understand it and realize that if we put strategies in place that center our efforts around public health, we're also making our communities safer. And that's really what the ACEs movement is all about. So you're, you're talking about getting in front of it, going, being upriver from these things and working with individuals before it, be, it shows up in your system. And, uh, and it, I think that people don't realize that ACEs and making kids resilient to them uh, can have that positive impact. You know, folks, if you want to hear more about this, uh, District Attorney Ben David has a TED Talk and just put TED Talk Ben David you know, come up and it's, it's I don't know, 12 to 15 minutes. It's phenomenal. And it'll give you an idea of, of exactly what we're talking about. Well, and thank you so much for saying that, Bill. And let me just give you an example of what we mean. Um, you know, you can ask a child 10 questions, 10 questions that have yes, no answers. And the answers will give you a profound insight into the likely trajectory of their lives. Here, here are some of those questions. Are your parents divorced? Is one of them incarcerated? Is there mental illness that's being experienced by one or more of your caregivers? How about domestic violence under the roof of your home? How about drug abuse going on? 
Are you food insecurity? That is, do you not know where your next meal is coming from? Are you being bullied right now? Are you the victim of mental or physical or even sexual abuse under the roof of your own home? A child who answers yes gets a point. So you get as many as 10 points uh, if you answer all 10 of those questions, yes. And if you're very lucky to live a great childhood, you might have a zero. Wow. Here's what we know from more than 30 years of looking at more than 400,000 people who took that survey um, in, a, in a great study that took place in San Diego years ago and following people for the next three decades. Someone who answers four or more of those questions, yes, is 70% more likely to be in the criminal justice system one day as a defendant or victim in a violent crime case. 62% of the IV drug users in my district answer four or more of those questions, yes. Teen pregnancy, substance abuse, depression, smoking, the list goes on and on. The higher the score, the higher all the stuff you don't wanna see, particularly with our children. But it gets worse than that because over time, your body literally changes when it's susceptible to the, what we call toxic stress. That is these terrible things that are pushing down on you every day. Think of a kid either who is living in a tough neighborhood and hears gunshots every day, and those are the adverse community environments we're talking about, or that little girl that's living in a home where her stepfather is, is raping her every week and she's an incest survivor. Those wow. children live with toxic stress, and when they do, their bodies quite literally change. They, they release chemicals into their own body that are a fight and flight response. And so through time, they develop all sorts of diseases like diabetes and ischemic heart disease and others. And we know that a child who answers six or more of those questions, yes, has a 20 year less life expectancy Wow. than, wow. than the ones who answer those questions zero or one. And so that's the terrible news. It's terrible because one in five of our children in North Carolina are gonna be investigated as victims of abuse before the age of five. We know that one out of eight girls are gonna be sexually assaulted before the age of 18. And so we know that there are challenges out there and, and it goes on and on, whether you're talking about community environments or childhood experiences that might be adverse for our children. But here's the really good news, men, and this is why I'm on your show right now. Just as there is an ACE score, there's a corresponding resilience score. Mm. It turns out that kids can bounce back. This is not a death sentence. If you have a high ACE score, you can actually overcome all of those things. We talk about adversity building character. But in order to do that, if you look at who has succeeded, every single one of them, almost without exception, had at least one loving adult in their life. Maybe it was a single mom, Maybe it was a piano teacher. Maybe it was a basketball coach. It was one caring adult who said, I am not going to let you fall through the cracks. And that young child can still succeed. And so what we need to do right now is identify where these children are in our criminal justice system. Maybe they're in child support enforcement court and their parents are getting a divorce. Maybe they're in foster care because both parents are drug addicted. Why are we waiting until they're in the criminal justice system as defendants or as victims before we're giving them resources today? So our chief justice understands, no, victims have constitutional rights in our state, just like defendants. And it's time we put our money where our mouth is and make the best investment we can. And that's in our children and at the earliest stage possible. That's the greatest return we'll ever have on our investment in this state. Well, you know, we do a youth resilience summit. We're getting ready to do one down in, uh, up in Raleigh. And, uh, we were there this week talking to folks, probably going to do it in the fall. We want to do one down in Wilmington with you. And, uh, we'll talk to you about that offline. Uh, so we're, we're a believer. And it's interesting when I, we started this journey, Odell and I were asked to do a youth protection symposium and, uh, uh, Dr. Kelly Graves and Sharon Hurst from Prevent Child Abuse, North Carolina, said, hey, we want to take you to lunch and talk to you about the focus that you have. And uh, I didn't know about ACEs. I didn't know about resilience. 
And after they explained it, I said, oh, we've got to change this whole direction. We've got to be talking about resilience. We've got to be talking about ACEs. And that, that we, they changed the whole focus for us. It, it, it's so intuitive. Once you understand it, it's an aha moment. You're like, that's what I've been trying to say forever. And, you know, there's some common sense things, right? I mean, just as an example, we know that the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. We've known that for years. We know that family is the building block of, of a child's success. We know all of these things already. And, you know, we need to stop being afraid to speak the truth. I'll, I'll give you one example of this. Our, our our co-chair on this great ACES task force, Andrew Heath, um, not only a former judge and someone who was an attorney in my district actually before he went on to all those state leadership positions he has now, he wrote his master's thesis on something called the success sequence. Uh, the success sequence says, regardless of your circumstance, there is a 98% chance you will never live in poverty if before you have a child of your own, you do just three things. We know this regardless of the community we're talking about in our great country. If you do three things before you become a parent, you will not live in poverty and do it in this order. The three things are graduate from high school, get a job and get married. You do those three things in that order, that child of yours will not be living in poverty. Now, if that order gets scrambled, there's a high likelihood that there's a different future in front of you. So even for our first generation kids, like the girls who attend GLOW, the, the Girls Leadership of Wilmington Academy, the first all charter, um, all female charter school in the state. These are girls who largely weren't going to be successful in college if they stayed on the normal trajectory. And we had people in this community say, we are not gonna let you fail. You are going to college, you're going to succeed. Those girls are within just a three months of graduating the first senior class after a six year journey that started in the sixth grade. And what we know about the statistics of sister institutions in other places like the Harlem Children's Zone where we stole this concept is mm -hmm. that they're much more likely, eight times in fact, more likely not only to go to college but to succeed once that they're there. These are, these are the future mothers of the children we're talking about. We, and, and when you train a young girl how to read, you're not just teaching an individual, you're teaching the next generation. Right. And so this is an approach that has to look at the home first. And it has to say, it's not the government's job to raise children, it's a family's job. And we're gonna mm -hmm. equip individuals and families to succeed. We're just going to be government leaders that understand fundamentally that we actually do believe in science. And, and what I'm talking about, this, this health science around resilience and ACEs is, is established beyond a reasonable doubt. And I would put it in any courtroom and prove it to a jury. But it's good old fashioned common sense and being unafraid to talk about values that keep our country great and make us individually great along the way. That's what we need to do, men talking to men. And that's why I love that the two of you have found common ground and are, are unafraid to look each other in the eye and tell your listeners, it really starts with us. We have yeah. to be accountable. It, our children will follow us, but we have to be the adults. Amen, well said. Odell? Well, Ben, you know, it's interesting that when you look at it from that perspective, one of the things you talked about crime mapping in one of your speeches and the whole idea of choices and consequences and the star. I love the fact that you had the star and you talked about government, nonprofit, school, business, and faith-based community, the starfish, excuse me. Talk about the, the, the church. I know you're a man of faith. And how has the faith community, whether it's the mosque, the temple, the synagogue, or the church, how have we behaved and what role can we play and what can we do better? Well, Dr. King, I mean, we, we just celebrated his birthday this past week. And, you know, we, we talk about the church shouldn't just be a thermostat measuring the temperature out there, but should be a barometer and, and be able to kind of turn the heat up on a certain issue and, and, uh, and bring certain things to the fore to make them moral issues and not just silly political ones. Look what the faith-based community did in Wilmington. Black and white churches coming together and saying, you know, 11 o'clock on a Sunday doesn't have to be the most segregated hour in our city. 
we we took over the old jail immediately across the street from the courthouse when it closed to make room for a much bigger jail in the suburbs. And that's happening all over the place. We said, what do we do with this jail? And the faith-based community got together and said, you know, let's not just give a man a fish. Let's not only just teach him how to fish, let's make a fish or a man. And we're gonna do that by taking this place of incarceration and turning it into a place for transformation. People had a negative experience by being here. Why don't any victim that Ben's talking about, any defendant who needs treatment, instead of sending them to jail and prison, instead of not giving them resources that's happening now, why don't we send them across the street because poverty doesn't have a car? Why don't we send them across the street to that old jail and we'll have 20 different nonprofits, things that deal with human trafficking and deal with domestic violence, but also drug addiction and mental illness. Let's have Habitat for Humanity there. If there needs to be a kid getting braces, let's get that taken care of in a one-stop shop. So we're looking at the whole individual, but also the whole family unit. And let's get that taken care of across the street and make it a family justice center. And if we do that as a faith-based community, we're actually gonna get more people understanding that when you take your mission out into the community and outside the walls of the four church, you're really doing God's work and you're likely to lead a lot more people to the gospel in the process. So what we've done here in Wilmington, and I encourage anyone to look at the Harrelson Center online, um, it is working. And it's something that is a best practice that I know can be replicated in other great communities in our state. Well, you know, my wife's part of a community connectors here in Greensboro through the police department. And uh, I came back, you know, I toured that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for setting that up for Jim and I. And I was blown away. I mean, you can go in there like like uh, Ben said, get all those things. You can get a bike, you can get food, you can get clothes. I mean, it's just about anything. You get your hair done. I mean, it's it's a phenomenal center. And uh, so I, I mentioned it to my wife and she says, we need to do one of these in Greensboro. So there, that community connector group is going to take a, a road trip down to see that place. And uh, and I think they're uh, they've already raised some money for it. Well, and sign me up when you guys come your way this way with with the, the incredible work you're doing. I, I want to continue to partner with you and and. We, we uh, shamelessly go to other communities to steal best practices. And so if we can offer up any um, in payback, we want to do that. Okay. And let me just say, because Odell mentioned it, about this starfish model. You know, we've all heard about the parable of the starfish, right? The little child running up the beach, finding starfish and throwing them in as quick as he can. And the older, wiser person says, what are you doing? And he said, I'm saving starfish. And, and they said, but you can't make a difference. Look at all the ones in front of you, the, the tide is receded, the, the sun is out, stop, you can't make a difference. And without looking up, the child throws the next starfish into the sea and said, it made a difference to that one, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that, that's the idea. And so we can talk about loving one individual at a time and that's resilience on an individual level, but these ACE scores that I mentioned and putting a strategic plan into place that links public safety and public health to each other is doing something even bigger. It's right. saying, we know where to look on the beach for the next starfish. And if we know where to look, don't we have a fierce urgency to do that right now? And, right. and what better can we do than to really have a plan that has five arms of outreach centered around public health to give these children a sense of belonging where they might not have the family support or neighborhood support that a lot of kids struggling with high A scores do not. And so those five arms of outreach in no particular order are the government. We really do have a role, nonpartisan, all three branches, a whole government approach. Working with the business community because nothing stops a bullet quicker than a good paying job and the street's always been an equal opportunity employer. And then working with the schools, I mentioned one of them earlier today, but schools should be the safest part of a kid's day and that's the pathway out of poverty is through education. And then nonprofits on the front lines working together has to be a role, particularly look into what Cape Fear Collective is doing here with looking at data to drive big decisions. And then finally, the faith-based community, you know, and, and, and centering it all on what we said earlier, what Micah said. It's not just the best DA uh, mission statement I've ever heard. It's the best mission statement for anyone to do justice, mm. to love mercy, and to walk humbly. We do those three things um, as men finding common ground with each other. And we do that 
around what I think women do much better than us, and that is to think more about our children and their health every day, then I know we'll be not only a healthier state, but a much safer one too. Well said, well said. You know, uh, we're getting near our end here, and I and I think we could go on for a couple hours, quite frankly. Oh yeah. But uh, yeah. you've you've got a you've got a job, and Odell's got a job, and I'm just sitting here having fun. Uh, I'm actually looking at a, a Michael Jordan jersey that we have in our podcast studio that he signed. So it was when you started talking awesome. about Michael Jordan, I'm looking at the jersey, going, "Wow, that's that's kind of cool." Uh, but and, this, and my, can I just add? You yeah, know, Odell, you mentioned our youth enrichment zone that the statistics that were coming out of there, um, you know, we had a deep dive looking at the children who were actually supposed to go to Michael Jordan's middle school, DC Virgo. It had closed because of the poorest test scores in the district year in and year out. Um, and what we found were there were 288 kids coming from 89 homes um, and a total of just four dads in those homes, raising all those wow. children. And wow, that was, Ben, say that again, Ben. Wait, wait yeah. a minute, Ben. Say that again, please. Yeah, there were there were over 285 children coming from 88 homes with a total of just four dads in those homes, mm. raising mm. them. And it, it should be no wonder that when we, when we looked at the crime statistics, we didn't pick the youth enrichment zone. It picked us. Highest mm. carjackings, open air drug transactions, murder, armed robbery. We looked at all those crime statistics and we said, how do we get in there and make a difference in the lives of the children? And, and what we said is let's, let's reopen DC Virgo and make it a school of excellence. We, we did some out of the box things. We, we did school uniforms. We involved the grandmothers who were raising these children and said, let's stretch the school day. Let's have laptop computers. Let's, let's really do some innovative things. And in just the first year, in just the first year, it went, to being the number one school in the district out of 42 of our elementary, middle and high schools as wow. the highest attendance rate in the county. And that's because when you give kids a safe place to learn and you have family buy-in for the people raising those children, it totally can make a difference. And we reduced violent crime in that zone by 28% by increasing graduation rates by 25% over the next three years. And so you can't tell me that the social determinants of health and the root causes of crime aren't related. What we need to do is work on putting sheriffs, judges, DAs out of a job because we're having so little crime, we don't need as many of us. Mm. That's ultimately working smarter. And what we've done in North Carolina, and this is a separate show, but we have closed 11 prisons in the last decade in North Carolina. We have saved $500 million under something called justice reinvestment, because what we said is we don't need to incarcerate our way out of every problem. We can't do that with mental illness, drug addiction, and particularly our kids. And so we've raised the juvenile age. We've, we, we've rewritten some of the um, structured sentencing laws to focus prisons for violent and career criminals and have treatment, mercy, and second chances for the people wow. who need that. And it's, it, it's lowering the crime rate while we're lowering incarceration. We can work smarter, but it really involves understanding that most people in the criminal justice system as victims and defendants are traumatized people. And until wow. you treat the underlying trauma, you're gonna be caught in that cul-de-sac of despair that's gonna be that revolving door we talk about at the courthouse. So this is about breaking the cycle. It's about second chances and it's about hope. And hope, as is famously been said, is not a strategy. The strategy is resilience, it's ACEs, it's time-tested, it's data-driven, and it has a lot of good people in it who say, don't just tell me, prove it to me. And we are convinced of it, and that's why we're bringing it on the road to every community in our great state. Amen. Well, Ben, I'm going to be, I'm going to tell you, have convinced me, I'm always believer, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to hit you ride with Bill. Maybe I could, you know, the old fashioned, you thumb and ride. I'm going to try to thumb and ride with Bill and get on up to, to Wake Forest. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm going to bring it. that. I, I'm gonna, I'd, I'd love to see you. Okay, I'm going to yes. bring that skinny, good looking black guy with me. There you go. That's the guy. That's the guy. Go ahead, Bill. Well, you know, the, uh, it's interesting. The, uh, uh, yeah, as you were describing that school, it, you know, it, it's obvious that 
those kids had aces, but you built in resilience and, and helped them th- to grow past those aces. And, and that's what we're talking about. You know, it's great that we have this seminar, uh, some summit that we go around and educate people, but it, it comes down to action. Uh, you got to teach them, understand what it is, and then put it into action so that people can, can do things like you did in that school. Take well, the, uh, if I may, I just want to say, you know, we had a blue ribbon commission on the prevention of youth violence that really brought all five arms of that starfish together. And it's precisely because no one took credit that it worked. I don't take credit for the success of those children. I hope those children um, feel personal agency over that. And Amen. The, the reason that the ACEs task force is succeeding is because the very first thing we said to each other is, our mission is going to be to make our community safer by lifting up our children. And we're going to set aside any differences that people normally camp out in to say, this should have a 100% approval rating. And it's working because people understand that the best interest of the child should always be the polar star for everything we do, regardless of whether we're in the court system or outside of it. And be a little humble enough to realize this movement around ACEs and resilience has been going on for years. Many of us are just coming to understand its implications now in our jobs, but let's use that science. Let's use that data to drive our decision and funding priorities. And we're going to be in a better place, not only today, but in years to come, if we plant the right seeds. Amen. But ben, Amen. You know, you made a good point. And one of the things that Bill and myself has ran into the buzzsaw of some entities that we saw talking about ACEs and resilience. And they're like, no, 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 we want to stay with youth protection. And we're like, no, 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 that's that's old school. That's it. No, 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 no. Because they have, they're camped out in this youth protection thing and they won't let it go because now it's not about the children, as you so eloquently stated, it's about the entity and other people. Did you, do you have to deal with that from time to time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, you look at a lot of funding cycles that are on grants, or you look at elections, and these are all short term. And, and while it's important to, you know, justify what it is that you're doing through, you know, these metrics, what you should really strive to do if you're serving people is be able to ultimately step out of the way and say, you can do it. You can do it for yourself, right? And that's that I'm in one of those rare jobs where we don't want to be busier. You know, we had a murder in my district yesterday. And forget about the fact that it's caused hundreds of man hours to be worked in law enforcement and the grief that's going to be associated with that moving forward. From an economic and emotional standpoint, it's massive. If we don't have that murder, um, we're still employed, but we're now able to focus on other things. And so what if we were to bring down the murder rate? What if we were to bring down the rate of incarceration? What if we were able to actually reduce crime? It's not that we are going to be out of a job necessarily. It's that we're going to be able to focus our energies on other things. And so, you know, if I were to sell cars, I'd want to sell one more car every year. But people who are in jobs that are trying to help folks who are in crisis gain autonomy and get out from under government, they should want to have fewer numbers year in and year out, not more, not more. And so the mindset is broken. When it says, "Hey, we're, we're, we keep growing here," if you're growing, you're not fixing the problem. What we should really be focusing on is how do we how do we you know m- move these numbers to a, a better place where we're not doing it. And that that's where I think um, we we sometimes lose our way when we we tend to reward things that that look like they've got hockey stick growth in terms of their numbers growing. For for those of us who are in a service industry about making people safer. And, and being self-sufficient, we should hope that our agencies are getting smaller, not bigger. Yep. Bill? Well, I tell you, you what, this, is, this has been great. Thank you, uh, Ben, for being on our show. Um, yes. And uh, the common ground thing, I think, uh, man, I was just listening to you doing common ground across a number of uh, platforms. <laughs> yes. That, that's certainly the goal. I mean, we're, we're really talking about, again, it, it, it's not – defund or refund, it's fully fund. We can all agree on that. Now, what that looks like in terms of, you know, keeping people safe and healthy, 
it, it is, is the debates that everyone engages in, but we all want the same thing. 8% of us go to the hospital on any given year, usually because of some traumatic event. 100% um, of us need to be worried about wellness and health every day. And what ACEs recognizes is that that acute trauma, that kid falling off the bicycle, breaking their arm, needing stitches, that's not the toxic stress that we see in the court system. The kid who lives under toxic stress answered multiple questions yes to those questions I posed earlier. And for that type of trauma, it is going to turn into joining a gang. It is going to turn into drug addiction. It is going to turn into choosing the wrong relationship and being trapped in a domestic violence case for years. It's going to be all of those things predictably if we don't do something to intervene now. But if we do, the great news is we can change the trajectory of that individual's life and let them be not only productive members of society, but leave healthy, happy lives that, that really get to raise their own children next and not be in the Department of Corrections or be a victim in a courtroom. That's the goal behind ACEs. And I'm so thankful for the leadership of everyone in the criminal justice system and outside of it who's working on this task force and this advisory committee. And I, I just encourage anybody who's listening now to learn a little bit more about it. Um, and I, I thank you for giving me this time with you gentlemen today and for what you all do every day in this friendship you've formed and the platform that you're on. Well, thank you. And I know that uh, if folks want to learn about the Resilience Task Force in North Carolina, there's a website for it. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what it is, but we'll post it on our platform and people can go and find that. I, I think if you put Resilience Task Force North Carolina and Google it, it'll come up. Through the administrative office of the courts, just type ACES Task Force and you'll find it pretty easy. Okay, very good. Well, thank you for being on our show. Yes. Thank, thank you, gentlemen, so you much. Well, God bless you. God bless you, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in Winston-Salem and in Wilmington and, and potentially in Greensboro, too. Thank you for what you're doing. Look, no problem. Just look for the good-looking, slim and trim black guy, and that will be me. <laughs> Find Bill and Odell online at thecommonground.show. This podcast is a production of BG Ad Group. Darren Sutherland, executive producer. Doug Harding, creative director. Jacob Sutherland, director. Producers Jason Gentarola and Matt Golden. And Jin Ray Zhang, video producer. All rights reserved. This podcast is brought to you by Yes Weekly, the triad's largest circulated and best read weekly magazine. You can also find us online at yesweekly.com and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yes Weekly, your trusted news leader for local arts, entertainment, music, food, and more for nearly 18 years. Whether you're a big, medium, or small business, managing and growing the bottom line is important. Focus CFO brings the experience and financial acumen of a Fortune 100 Chief Financial Officer to your company at a fraction of the cost. PL help, internal reporting processes, or any business transitions or events, Focus CFO will help you and your team have a CFO in your company's back pocket. Focus CFO. Learn more at focuscfo.com.